Thank you guys so much uh, for joining us today. Um, actually, the recording guy has stepped out, so it's recording. Um, and to our session uh, about annotation on campus, um, we have uh, three, I'm the moderator of the session, we have three presenters, uh, one of whom is joining us remotely from uh, NCSU. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, <coughs> annotation uh, on campus. So I'm Heather Staines. Uh, I'm the head of partnerships with the MIT Knowledge Futures Group. We build open source uh, infrastructure for publishers, libraries, researchers, and the like. A um, uh, little bit of a different order than the slide. Um, our second presenter will be Micah Vandegrift, uh, who's joining us, as I said, from uh, NCSU. Um, and then we'll hear from Alan Reed. Uh, from Coastal Carolina University, and then uh, uh, Bruce Porter in the front from Hypothesis is gonna, is gonna bring us home. So when we were preparing for this session, um, uh, my, it felt to me to sort of give a little bit of a, a quick intro to, to annotation and what are some of the changes that have happened recently that we think uh, are really going to be the catalyst for um, more use of annotation in a variety of different segments. Um, in February 2017, the W3C approved uh, annotation as a web standard. So that should mean, in the course of time, different browsers will build in annotation capabilities so that you no longer need to use plugins and things like that. Uh, but until that happens, there's a lot of um, uh, possibility around um, using different types of services uh, in different uh, segments. Um, I come from the, the publisher side myself and a variety of tools that are available that you can use uh, for annotation. We're gonna tell you a little bit about some of them today, and we wanna make sure that we um, have some time for questions at the end. So um, just really quickly, um, at the MIT Knowledge Futures Group, we have a hosting platform that's called PubPub, uh, which has annotation, and one of the coolest projects that happened before I joined, so I can't take any credit for it whatsoever, um, is a publication of uh, celebrating the 200th anniversary of uh, Frankenstein's uh, publication as, as a work. It's called Frankenbook. Um, it was the first uh, book link uh, content piece uh, on the PubPub platform, um, and it helped us a lot to conceptualize how that type of uh, content would, would live. Um, it uses annotation in a variety of different ways. Uh, it has annotation by experts in different categories like science or uh, politics, things like that. Um, you can see the little uh, color-coded tags. So while the, the managers were prepared for publication, um, these experts came in and added um, their input. Um, they have uh, explanations and discussion prompts um, throughout the manuscript. And one of the things that I love is you can actually filter on these different tags and kind of almost choose your own adventure. If you want to go through and say, just look at philosophy and politics, um, you can do that. You can sort um, you know, the different uh, annotations there. There's a lot of other stuff that lives with um, Frankenbook that if you're interested, I can tell you about um, later. Um, but if you do have um, you know, any questions about uh, PubPub, ask me. It's free uh, to create communities. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn over to our uh, second presenter, uh, Micah. And I'm gonna drive the slides because we've got a lot of moving technology pieces here. Um, and uh, take it away, Micah. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Sure, thank you. And uh, thanks, Heather, and uh, everyone for showing up. And I was just tweeting that I'm sorry I'm not uh, able to be there um, in the building, but uh, at least this year I'm on the same continent. Uh, last year, Heather and I did another presentation, and I was uh, in Iceland a lot more. Decidedly warmer this time, um, and in the same time zone, so this is a much easier presentation for me. So thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to introduce you all to, to Carlos Geller, who you see on the screen there. Uh, part of the, the work that I've done around annotation, most of it actually has been focused on the pre and post publication work goes on the, as things are already out there online. Um, so working with Carlos has been the first opportunity that I've Hey, Micah, you're, you're I've had, Micah, uh, sorry, you're hanging up. Backwards in the, um, the, um, the Hey, Micah, you're hanging a little bit, so I'm actually going to turn your video off. Or can you turn your video okay. off so that we can get maximize our bandwidth? Thanks. Let's try again. Sure. Okay. 
Uh, I was just saying that I, most of my work has been focused on the scholarly communication end of annotation. So working with Carlos has been the first time that I've been able to do some of that in the classroom. So our relationship with Carlos started um, through what we have uh, this old textbook program here at NC State University Libraries where we award many grants to uh, faculty or researchers who uh, want to adapt an assignment or uh, uh, just find ways to make the learning materials uh, in the classroom more accessible, um, cheaper for students. But Carlos was awarded an alt textbook grant, and one of the um, outcomes of that grant was the um, Metagenomics Press books that you see in the middle of the screen there. So Carlos, uh, we, we awarded him the grant, produced the textbook, and then he started to think really creatively about ways to involve the courses that he was already teaching and the students in the classroom in the production of the textbook. He didn't want this to just be, uh, you know, Carlos typing away on his computer um, to build a, an open uh, educational resource about. The economics, he wanted to invite this. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please, Heather. <laughs> But this summer, uh, so that, that textbook grant was a year or so ago, but this summer we um, had Carlos also included in our open incubator program, and there's the link at the bottom of the screen there if you'd like to learn more about that. Basically, the open incubator is meant to be a, uh, a research development program that's structured about five to seven weeks regularly meeting. It's a cohort-based learning environment. Um, we had seven participants, Carlos was one, uh, and the, the project that he brought to us was this concept of how to um, integrate his students into the production of that open textbook for metagenomics. So we, we brainstormed a little bit throughout the, the time he was part of the incubator. Uh, the images that you see are the sort of final outcome of how we finally <coughs> set up to the content that would be part of the OER, the metagenomics uh, textbook. So we introduced Carlos, uh, you've been familiar with uh, Hypothesis as a tool and as the, the scholarly practice of annotation generally, um, but wasn't really aware of ways to integrate in the classroom. So you can see uh, brainstorming ways to use tags, is this a public or private group? Um, how uh, do we need a controlled uh, taxonomy for the types of tags? Types of ways to invite the students in, and then how does the material, the discussion that happens through annotation, get moved into uh, the actual text of the book on the Pressworks platform? Next slide, please. Evan. So this is sort of the um, uh, the some some of the text of the actual assignment that Carlos put together that he gave to his students. So this is happening right now this fall. Um, as you can see, the, the learning outcomes for Carlos were to um, use annotation as a way for the students to engage with the readings, which I think is one of the one of the best um, best parts of what annotation uh, provides, and that it can happen in a shared environment. That it's not just one person highlighting or or, um, or writing uh, notes in the margins, uh, but many people together. Uh, you can see also that Carlos. Was, uh, asking for quite a lot for uh, ten meaningful annotations, and that you know he uh, it finds that it's something that's relevant and thoughtful and specific. So not just I like this point or um, this is a cool graphic. He really wanted to see some engagement from there. And that bottom block is the um, Carlos in our concept of how um, how do we take what happens in the annotation and move it to the textbook. So uh, he came up with this concept of a sort of a synthesis report. So after the students read an article and co-annotate over, uh, I think it's about a two-week period, a smaller group of four people will work together to write a synthesis. So they will go back through the study, um, read all of the comments, uh, compile that down into a, into a document. I think it's supposed to be three to five pages. Um, and then that would be the thing that would lead into uh, the, the, the publication, the, the press books. Uh, next slide, please. So how's it going? Um, uh, as I mentioned, this is in progress. 
right now, and I'm very lucky that um, the assignment came before we were uh, meant to do this presentation, otherwise this slide would look pretty blank. But as you can see, there's been a ton of activity in the last several weeks. Uh, and, um, and emailing with Carlos, it seems that the students are really engaged in taking this assignment and um, the tool wasn't a, a barrier to them, so kind of getting into the um, hypothesis and, and the, the way to use it. Uh, so there's a ton of activity. I'm jumping in here and there to, uh, I'm obviously not that familiar with the science of microbiology, but I'm um, interested in following the conversations and adding um, a little um, context or, or knowledge where I can. Next slide, please. So this is a, um, from a, um, a journal article that Carlos and some of his colleagues wrote about um, sort of starting to outline some core competencies for bioinformatics in undergrad education. And as you can see, they sort of divided um, a, a range of skills. These have been sort of adopted by a, a now. But what I really liked about this slide, and I haven't actually uh, had an opportunity to talk to Carlos about it, was that they divided these skills between knowing skills and practicing skills. And as you can see with my um, my bold annotation there in the middle, I think that the, the activity, the exercise that Carlos is having them do um, using uh, hypothesis uh, in the classroom environment and then the synthesis that becomes the textbook is a really effective way for spanning that um, knowing skills and practicing skills getting the students to engage with the scholarship and then also become producers of the scholarship. Final slide, please, Heather, thank you. So, uh, in summary, uh, this has been a really, uh, a really exciting um, partnership with Carlos and um, what I wanted to sort of illustrate with this graphic is this is the first time, I know this happens in many different corners, but this is the first time for me that I've seen a really, really clear connection between uh, a scholar's research agenda, the application of a digital method, in this case, um, annotation using hypothesis, involving those two things in the context of a learning community, and then the outcome being a, a work of scholarship that will continue to feed and uh, cycle back into Carlos's research and the research that his students go on to do in the broader field of micro microbiology and metagenomics. Uh, so that's all I have. I'm happy to wait for questions. Yeah, I think, uh, Micah, we're going to take questions at the end, so I'm going to hand over uh, to Alan. Oh, okay, so real quick. Um, Use the microphone because we're recording, please. How many uh, of you currently use some type of annotation program or system? No one. Well, you probably do first, and then you use hypothesis specifically. Yeah. Wow. Do you have uh, teaching faculty in here at all? One, two, all right. Uh, so I'm going to take this in a different direction and talk a little bit more about uh, annotation as evaluation in the classroom. Um, but this is uh, this can be applied to your positions as well. And what's going on there? Um, so my background is a professor of writing and instructional technologies. Uh, so I use this daily. Go ahead. Keep going in the classroom uh, with a range of students I, I teach from time to time first year writing students so you're facing comp students uh, and then uh, high level graduate students who are doing their um, theses and dissertations and are uh, doing their reading that way we're using hypothesis um, and the real basis behind using hypothesis is so that i can get um, a look into their reading processes uh, I'm trying to make this reading process more visible because often we just assume that we can tell uh, students to read something and that they're going to do it well. Uh, and often we focus on the writing aspect as the assessment part, when in fact we also need to be looking at um, the origin, which is the critical reading process. And so to do that, I use hypothesis in uh, all of my assignments um, to measure and to monitor their ability to critically read uh, what we're talking about for that class. Um, and so sometimes we use it as a way to facilitate discussion, um, you know, so that they can have discussions within the central texts in the class. 
Uh, but mostly I would say I use it to uh, get students to become more aware of their own personal reading habits. So um, I have a lot of background in digital reading research, and if you uh, are aware of any of that um, area, we know that students read paper and digital very differently. Um, and in fact, the danger there is that when students read something digitally, they tend to uh, read it differently, but they don't use as many strategies. Um, so the annotation strategies tend to go out the window. Even though PDF Acrobat um, has a little highlighting tool and a comment tool and a text tool, it has all the things they need, they tend not to use those things as much as they do with a pen and paper. And so what Hypothesis does is it steps in and it encourages them to engage in that annotative behavior. Um, I use it particularly within our LMS canvas. Got it, sorry. So uh, it's able to be integrated into a variety of LMS, which Bush will talk about, I suppose, in a minute. But um, this is a, essentially an overview of what it might look like on a student's screen. So they'll see the text pop up for them and what they've highlighted so far over here to the right, number two, this is a drawer that pulls out that when they click on that, it shows them what they've highlighted, what they've commented on, what they've read, the number of annotations that they've made and things like that. Um, they can turn this off and on as well. So as you, would, as you can imagine, if I have 60 people annotating a single document, it just turns into all highlighted text, right? Which can be very distracting for the student, but it's easily hidden just by clicking the eye, so they don't see that anymore. Um, this is what it looks like on my end, because when I do want to turn this into an assessment that I'm grading them on, um, in Canvas they read the article, uh, there's no login or anything like that, it's just integrated into their um, Canvas account. They highlight, annotate, make substantive comments, and when I go in to actually assess it and give it a score, I can see all the comments that that user has made on that document, the number of comments, um, any replies that he or she has made, and then I can give it a score and then leave my feedback for that student. Um, so they have some general guidelines, similar to what Micah mentioned earlier. They um, have to make substantive comments, they have to be additive, they can't just be affirmative or um, non sequitur, I mean they have to make some type of contribution to the text or they can ask questions and things, those count. Um, but I'll tell you the, the number one question I get from students is how many annotations do we have to have? <laughs> Micah's professor friend uh, says 10. I don't give them a number, I just say enough. You know? <laughs> but uh, for some that means four and others that mean 40. I mean, it really gives you a little bit more insight into their reading processes and how they view uh, their what they're reading. Um, and I can tell you I do try and tweak their behaviors over time. I say, like, I see you made three annotations where you're writing a full paragraph in each annotation, but I'd rather see you interact with that text more, more frequently, um, at, at deeper levels, um, and things like that. So really, they get the sense that they're not doing this so that I can grade them, but I'm trying to get them to interact with the text frequently, as opposed to what they typically will do in a digital reading environment, which is skim and scan, read the first part, kind of jump to the end, that sort of thing. This tethers them to the text in a way that they don't typically experience if they didn't have this type of assessment along with the exercise. So reading the text becomes part of that assessment experience instead of just saying, hey, read this and respond to somebody, right? Um, embedded discussion occurs a lot. I don't require that they reply to each other, but I encourage it. I say, if you see someone saying something that you agree or disagree with strongly, then this is your opportunity to interact with that person. And they do often. This doesn't happen, in my experience, this doesn't typically happen when we do this in a discussion forum. Uh, when I'm saying, read, read this text and reply to each other. It seems forced. In this environment, I don't require it, but it seems to happen more often because as they're reading, those thoughts are percolating in their head. They're saying, you know what, I disagree. And I'm going to count this as one of my annotations too, by the way. Um, so it, it happens a lot more frequently in this environment. So 
that's, uh, to me, the importance of this tool or the importance of online annotation in general is that it makes these processes and these habits more visible, especially to the faculty member um, or to someone who's trying to understand what are you getting out of this material. Um, it's much easier to track and to see and understand. Um, all right, I believe I'm gonna turn it over to Butch. Oh, thank you. Uh, when Heather asked me to speak, and then she told me that there were going to be folks from NC State and from Coastal, I was like, well, I really don't need to say anything. I'd much rather uh, have Alan and Micah talk about how they use our product than for me to sit up here and talk about hypothesis. I will say a few things. It, it is very simple in concept, right? The idea of annotation is nothing new. We've been doing it since, you know, the, the, the opening of our press. But, as Alan said, when we moved to digital content, some of that started to go away. And on hypothesis, especially as Heather said, with the W3C standard, which we led, we believe we can bring that back, and uh, that's what we focus on every day. I think I just clicked this green button here. This is something that's been very, very successful for us over the past six months. Uh, if you're uh, in the classroom, then you'll understand the power of this. Alan just spoke to it a little bit inside of Canvas, and that is the LMS integration. Prior to the LMS integration functionality, it was a little clunky to get 50 students in a classroom to annotate. You'd have to act, get them in the code, et cetera, et cetera. We've solved that problem, and we're very proud of that. We're now integrated with Blackboard. We're integrated with Canvas. We're integrated with D2L. We're a partner of Moodle. Um, there are six major LMS companies. Four of them are already integrated in. And we're not, integration means different things, so I should probably, right now we're focusing on single sign-on. So as Alan said, the student does not have to remember any login. And we're focusing on gradebook, right? Faculty do want to assign annotation activity for all the great reasons that Alan talked about. And so those are the two functionalities I'm gonna talk about integration. Um, Sorry, I think they are. I have like an issue here. Um, I just keep going. Yeah, without the sorry, without the screen sharing, we can't get to the controls. Micah, I'm gonna have to um, switch you off, unfortunately. <coughs> but annotation can be used for a lot of things. We're very proud of the partnership with NC State and things along those lines as well as our scholarly publishing companies that utilize us, as well as the traditional publishers that utilize us, people that are developing OER content and want to see where it can be approved. They are focusing on, okay, where are all the annotations being made? Alan made uh, a point that I heard um, one of our publishing clients say the other day, students want the answer as soon as they want to have the question. And with the annotation, and as Alan mentioned, they are collaborating inside of Hypothesis at a rate that, quite frankly, we found uh, very rewarding and a little surprising that students would engage at that level um, with each other. You know, one of them called, one of the students quotes that I use in some of our slides, she says, this is my educational Facebook, right? And that was pretty powerful. All right, we'll just move on here. Uh, we are running pilots. I have a business card there. If any of you are interested in piloting in a hypothesis inside of the LMS, we're providing webinars, we're providing training. It is a software as a service business model, so you don't need to download anything at all in order to get started. Um, we have a director of education, a gentleman named Dr. Jeremy Dean, who is running that program. Um, I am new to hypothesis, but I happen to be lucky enough to live in Charleston. So they asked me if I would come and represent us today while Dr. Dean stays in Austin. And I said, sure, no problem. So anyway, uh, this is just a little bit about the pilot. Indiana University, University of Michigan, we're partnering with the Unison schools. If some of you are following the activity around Unison, we're very proud of that. Uh, here's just a sampling in my use, certainly proud of that. Um, Davidson, uh, Virginia should be on there somewhere. But all of these schools are in official pilots with us. We now have 23 schools that are in these official pilots but we've had over 248 uh, installs of the LMS functionality since July. It's just really, really taken off, all because of the work like Alan and Mike and stuff like that. 
Uh, I have, like I said, I have a business card there. I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Uh, we're super excited about the work we're doing with Scholarly Publishers. We, um, uh, the McGraw-Hill Access Series, I saw their table. Some of you may have access, but may utilize that. They've installed Hypothesis, and we're getting tremendous usage there, especially in the Access Science, which we were really surprised to see that uh, outpace some of the humanities courses. So anyway, we've got faculty here that use it. If you have any questions, and I'll, I'll be right there in the corner. There's a card, there's some cool little stickers there. Help yourself, thank you. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left for questions. I'm not sure if I should, I, I, I've let Micah go. He doesn't have to stay. But he, he said he's happy to field any um, questions that you might have for him via email. You can get his email from me um, later on. But uh, we'll, we'll let Alan maybe field the educational questions that I can maybe fill in. Uh, I was, uh, prior to the KFG, um, I was at Hypothesis for two and a half years, and I'm addicted to annotation. I will be the first human to pass 100,000 annotations because I'm at 93,000 now. It's changed. I'm obsessed with it. Anyway, I'll tell you before right now. I'll talk to you later. But um, any questions uh, for, uh, for, for, for Alan or Butch, and I would ask for me to answer to, to come up because we're recording, and it'd be better to go through that. You guys should shout your questions. Uh, questions? Yes. You, want to you don't have to. I'll restate the question oh, okay. just for the. Um, I'm Cambridge University Press, and um, we've been looking at this for a while. I know. Um, I'm not the point person on it, but I know one of the things um, we've also done is work with Ruzal, who also is similar to this, but he has a more of an ass the assessment is automated on, on theirs, and they have the ability to break things down into small groups. Because if you have 50 students all annotating on one. And that's one of the questions I have. What's that kind of functionality? Do you see the future for this? Or, you know, the, there there are, answer here? That'd be great. Um, yeah, we, we kind of we, we glossed over that, but there are uh, groups and things you can create within those texts or classes or however you want to break that down so that they can, in different settings as well, you can only see your own group, you can keep it private, you can be entirely public. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely modify those settings to whatever how about the assessment side? Because you that was impressive what you're doing uh, in assessing your students. Um, do you see that there'll be it, theirs is an automation one? It, I can see where that can get with large classes. Because um, I do know one of the things that someone who sells textbooks a lot is student engagement with reading is one of the biggest challenges that's out there. I mean, it really is. I hear it uh, everywhere. We, I called from Charleston on Monday. I can't get students to read the book. Yes. And I assume that's it seems to be what should drive it. I can't get my a lot of my students to read a two-page article. Um, it, you know, <laughs> and, and I think a, a part of that is um, is the nature of digital. Um, it might be their um, their habits, their, their reading habits as it is. I think typically um, it's just shorter and, and more bursts rather than long-form reading um, like we do. We do a lot of. Uh, uh, we do a lot of reading from um, things like uh, long form and um, you know a lot of a lot of lengthier articles online, which is very challenging for them. Um, but as far as the assessment goes, I I mean I try not to focus entirely on you know I'm trying to grade you on this. It's more or less for me um, a way to be a, more aware of, of how they're reading because like I said so many times we just assign something like a reading and then we focus on the response part you know and usually there's a straight correlation between how well you're reading something and how effectively you can respond to it you know um, and so obviously the students who are producing better responses and better uh, writing are the ones who are engaged in that reading process more and so that's what that's for, really. I mean, I, I do have a grading scale. It's like a five-point scale, and it's really just very quick to kind of go through and grade things. I don't spend a whole lot of time on it. I, I try not to focus on the number of annotations that you make, but I want to see, like, high-level interactivity. I want you to be in, just active when you're reading, and that's what the goal is, and they know that. To be um, fair, their, their assessment is really only three, three levels. That's not the acceptable one. That's what's okay. That's yeah. really good. <laughs> that's, that's really kind of, what it should be. Yeah, I mean. 
But you can do entire critical reading assignments as well based on this and not have a written component. But this is the evaluation itself. How well can you read? That's an objective. That's a course learning outcome in a lot of first year writing courses. And, um, a lot of students, I'm sure, come to the library to come seeking assistance on those sorts of things. So, yeah. I'm a big fan of annotations, I don't have as many as the head of that. Um, what's the sort of stickiness? So they have to do this as part of the course, first year reading. Um, what, how many people, do you have any evidence of data that shows what they do? They take this into other courses, you know, you mentioned the prolifer proliferation of STEM, which is also, but how many of your students are you just talking about as course? How many of them carry on using the course? Do you try uh, that? Would you know that? Or? You, you can't. There are actual um, tools, there are third party tools. One, um, developed by um, a, a friend of Hypothesis, uh, Remy Clear, who developed uh, Crowd Layers, which is a separate site. Uh, but what you can do is you can plug in any username from any student, and it shows all of their data, um, all sorts of analytics based on what they've done on Hypothesis, which is a fascinating look. Get more on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or please keep going. But one of the things that uh, we, we're tracking growth rates, and Macmillan asked us about some humanity statistics. And our number of humanities users has increased by 118% over the past eight months. The number of annotations has increased 230%. So once they start using it, then you become the person with 90,000 annotations. Yeah. So that's exactly the kind of traction we're seeing. And I would, I would also add to that that you're, it's, you're curating a behavior there. And that's the goal. It's not to treat it like a, a grade. How many do I have to do to get this grade? You're curating their behavior so that they go on from there and begin to implement annotation in every other course that they're doing, which they, they probably do to a, a lesser degree, but just making that available to them um, in a world where they're, they're reading things digitally all the time, um, I think it's a, it's a valuable tool. So. And if, if I could just add, you know, one of the things about hypothesis is you can use it, you know, anywhere. Within with these LMS integrations, it's enabling single sign-on so the students don't have to create a separate account. And one of the projects a little bit further down the line for hypothesis is to enable them to connect what they've done as a student to what they're doing, you know, out in the wild. And there's a lot of reasons, you know, for privacy purposes why that information is not yet connected up. Um, but that is coming and I think at that point Hopefully the, the light bulbs are going to go off for them, and, and they'll just, you know. So. Sorry. Alan did such a good job answering the Prusol question, but I, I do want to piggyback on that. That's okay. a big difference between us. I have a great deal of respect for her. He's a right? I, I don't know where you my background, but I, I've been following him. So let's get that. But the Prusol annotation is you have to buy the published product from them. And that's why so many of the big publishers are talking to us right now, is that they want to embed annotation inside of their content and not have another book distributor that they have to deal with. So this idea of annotations inside, outside, you can take them with you for a lifetime. That's all philosophy. Uh, we have another question? Sorry. I have one. You kind of answered it already, Heather. I was just getting at um, sort of the portability. You know, we're hoping that people start using hypothesis yeah. and then use it forever, wherever they go. They're undergrad, their grad degree. And so it seems like that integration into a non-LMS or non-institution specific identity is really important for that sort of lifelong right. um, integration, I guess. And presuming that that is, it sounds like that's coming sooner on the roadmap, which is really exciting. And so in that case, they would have access to their whole book of work they did in any of those institutions that are attached to other identities. Is that how that would work? Yeah, I mean, right now, through Hypothesis directly through the API, you can get all of your annotations, and some people, as um, as uh, Alan mentioned, incorporate them into dashboard projects like the one that uh, the Crowd Layers project that Remy Clear has. And the idea being, if you have annotations that fit the standard, you can take them out of one tool and, and put them in another standard-based tool. So right now, again, obviously for privacy reasons, enabling someone to to take you know information out of, of the LMS needs to come with like certain protection. Sure. But um, for uh, instructors who are using Hypothesis as a standalone, um, you know, that's something that, that those students could get their annotations uh, you know, now. So it just kind of depends on the circumstances. Okay. If they're looking at, at the LMS post their college career, do they still see that it's all within the same LMS? Or do they have to, is each course its own thing? 
this, the annotations would be theirs all inside of the LMS, and that is why we're partnering with the LMS companies right now to where we can just turn it on across all their courses. Yeah, yeah. And so even if, uh, let's say, a marketing instructor used annotation, but the astronomy instructor didn't, the student would still be able to annotate because it were integrated with Canvas, for example. Yeah. And so we're looking to turn it on Canvas live, and I'm writing that program. Okay. So they would have annotation everywhere. Got two questions here. I think you were first, and then next. Go ahead. Um, so, um, I saw the Indiana University Partnership. I know they have the Institute of Digital Arts and Humanities there, and they are crazy about annotation there. That was one of their main fo focuses. And so, I'm kind of interested about hypothesis and how it, maybe, first of all, how the library can uh, help with maybe training and things like that and uses outside of the classroom potentially and also for scholarship for faculty is there any way that faculty can maybe use this outside of our classroom in their own works absolutely um you, i mean i'll be glad to take that certainly scholarship we have a lot of um, oxford university press uses us i'm talking to university of california press this afternoon about expansion i'm talking to um, American Plant Biology Association tomorrow about expansion. So certainly the scholarly press is using us quite a bit. Um, ways that librarians could help us drive usage. We would love to do webinars, provide you with some training materials that we have. I mean, we want, uh, as I said, I am new to Hypothesis, but everybody there, as Heather has attested, they believe the world should annotate. They led the W3 standard. They think annotation is a big, big deal. And so we have all sorts of tools to help drive usage. I hope that answers the question. Can I add just a couple things on the researcher front? So um, there are a lot of publishers who are experimenting with annotation around different types of peer review, whether it's open community review for anyone to participate either pre or post publication, or whether it's traditional peer review but managed in a um, e-journal press as an integration with hypothesis so that reviewers can decide if they want to write a traditional review or if they want to add annotations onto the manuscript and then the author gets a summary report or they can view the annotations in place. On the researcher front, there's a lot of interesting things being done around identifiers. So if you're in the, um, the life sciences, there are research resource identifiers that tell you which stem cell line was used or where a reagent was purchased. So for reproducibility purposes, there's a group out of um, University of California, San Diego um, that started this project called Cybot. So Cybot is an auto-generated, human-curated around these resource, research, research resource identifiers so that if you need to know what those numbers uh, correspond to, and you don't want to open another tab and go to an external database and look it up, it will actually show you uh, on the page you know, what that is. And then if you find a particular stem cell line that's really useful, you can click on that tag and it will show you all of the other papers across all the publishers that use that particular thing. So that's a really exciting. Um, and we've got three minutes for one more question. Oh, um, so I guess, you know, like the acquisitions part, like if, is this um, like a campus-wide license that we purchased for the library or, or does, is, are you mostly approached by like, um, like learning designers and in our university it's a little bit separate, like things that you need to support Canvas and for, for teaching sometimes is bought with kind of different where are you from? Uh, Florida Gulf Coast. Okay, well, welcome. Okay. I've been to your campus many times. Okay. Uh, we are working with some of our most active users on our pricing model. That is the best answer. Right now, what we are doing is like uh, some California consortiums are, are, are paying clients. And they are telling us we need X number of licenses and we sell them X number of licenses at X price. And that is the pricing model today what it's going to look like in the future. We're really relying on our user community to tell us what they want. Some people are telling us they never want to see a student pay model. Others are telling us we don't have the budget, we have to have a student pay model. But right now the pricing is coming in somewhere around five to eight dollars per student. And that's for, they can annotate in any of their classes. All right, now that's only if you have the LMS functionality. If you don't have that, it's free. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. And one more minute? Yeah, sorry, just to piggyback off yeah. that. So is that just going to be a one time or is that per year? That's, better record that. Yeah. <laughs> right now, it's per year. But these enterprise tools that we're building are just now being built, right? And so uh, we're calling it a, a premium business model. We have like 300,000 users. 
and those that want to add software as a service, the hosting, the tier one support, the integration, those type of things, they come with a price. But the product itself is free, we're committed to open, we are an open source software development company. So, there you go. Great, thank you. Great. one more, we have one minute. Pretty good. Okay, well, um, thank you guys so much for coming. I will say I forgot to mention when I talked about Frank and books, so they won't forgive me. Uh, but it, there is classroom. The reason I wanted to show it is it is being used in classrooms, and you do have the ability to have a private group on top of um, that as well. So uh, I know we were really big uh, hypothesis supporters here. Um, you know, really exciting, but uh, annotation as an activity, you know, is is breaking out all over the web. Uh, and if you have any other questions, I think we can hang around uh, for a few minutes uh, and answer them. And we'd love to hear from you, your feedback. And if you're an annotator, you know, yay. Uh, and thanks to our presenters. And I will let Micah know that we had a great question and answer for you here. So have a great rest of your day.